Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Words on Whiskey, episode 46. And our guest this evening is Patrick Shelley, founder of Origin Spirits, uh, founder and managing director. So, look, thank you all very much for joining us. You're all very welcome. I uh, hope we do have uh, some nice drink aside. And we're going to introduce it to Patrick and the brand that he has created uh, from scratch and we'll talk about lots of different things if you have any questions please do post them in the uh, comments there we, i'm sure patrick will be delighted to answer them and uh, we'll just bring in patrick now so good evening patrick hey sergio how are you how are you i'm very good I'm you're very, good. very welcome i know you're in paris at the moment so you're an hour ahead of us I, think I it's am, an hour, but it's no it? problem. It's an hour ahead, yeah. It's an hour but, ahead. But uh, great, great, great to be on Words of Whiskey, and great to see you again. Well, yeah, it's been. It's, I, I'm trying to think when we first met, and I'm. I, I think it was at a uh, Whiskey Live, but I can't remember. Was it the first Whiskey Live in the print house, or was it in? That's right. Yeah, yeah, I it I remember first... that well. And we just had, uh, I think, uh, one product then, so Calac. Yeah. I'm not wrong. Yeah, you stood out. You stood out like a sore thumb, if you don't mind me saying so. In the sense, there was nobody else there doing any other spirit other than yourself. And they kind of, I kind of passed by your desk, uh, your your stand, and I was thinking to myself, you know, do I even want to try this stuff? But the bottle drew my attention. Was the first thing, actually, if I'm honest. So yeah, it's true. Just, we, I, I, I think we were the only non whiskey at the show, so obviously we raised a few eyebrows. And, yeah. I do but, remember uh, you promising me that you would never release a whiskey. <laughs> well, I said that with gin too. You said that with gin too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me for for a start, how has uh, how has this year <laughs> been with all the COVID issues, and obviously you've been travel restricted and so forth. It's been it's been a tough year. I think um, there's been kind of positives and negatives. You know, I think the negatives are obviously, as you mentioned, the fact we can't travel. Um, our business is very much uh, a personable business. You know, building relationships with our uh, partners, our distributors, and that's incredibly important. You know, to get out on the ground and support them. Yeah. Um, I think it's also given us a lot of. Uh, ideas for the future and uh you know particularly using much more online platforms for trainings and for dealing you know talking to our our key partners around the world um but um i think it's also kind of shown us how there's always an opportunity in in a in the crisis um yeah not just ourselves i'm not talking about origin spirits but i think in general uh, a lot of the the spirits brands have seen an incredible uh, increase in off trade sales and particularly online yeah. during the pandemic um you know unfortunately we we're, we're all significantly down in terms of the on premise um but we're not forgetting that we're we're trying to keep in, in close contact with our with our key partners there so there's been a lot of learnings. Um, I think it's also given us a lot of time to reflect, you know, because we we had a little bit more time than we would normally have yeah. uh, in terms of product development, you know, how we want the, the company, the portfolio to look in the future. So I think that's all been incredibly positive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you find that perhaps the current situation has been a leveler maybe for the smaller brands, you know, the opportunity to leverage the internet and social media and so forth to actually gain the reach that uh, the big players have also. No, I totally agree, Sergio. So I think that's been, that's been uh, something which has been very important to us. I think I also learned, uh, you know, during the pandemic, particularly in, de in contacting importers and distributors around the world, uh, I think people have got to become a lot more discerning. Uh, yeah. You know, during the pandemic, they've, they've taken a lot of brands out of their portfolios that maybe weren't uh, performing to the level they wanted. 
so they were looking at kind of renewing the the whole um their portfolios and that's given great opportunities and i think particularly for brands that uh, stand out that have that point of difference that unique selling point as we say in marketing um so so yeah i think it's been very very positive yeah I, one of the things uh, about your brand is that you're 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 in the public eye but you don't put yourself very much forward in in the public eye you're very much kind of get down to business, do the work and make the contacts and be very face to face <clears> with people. Um, for those uh, people that don't know you, could you tell us a little bit about your, your background, where you're from and how you came to enter the drinks business and then how you entered to start your own business? Sure. Um, before I even start, I'd say, Sergio, I'm a lot of people that know me are surprised to hear that I'm quite shy. Yeah. Um, for me, it's it's all about you know uh, creating uh, the brands I created is really to give the brand spotlight rather than myself or the company, yeah. and that's why Origin Spirits as an entity as such we we don't really market it's it's really the the individual brands. <clears throat> I think my my journey started uh, it's, it was quite unusual actually because I went basically the full circle. Uh, from commodity trading into luxury goods within uh, three years. Right. So it started, you know, after I left college, uh, quite a long time ago, actually now, but I started trading um, food commodities uh, for a UK uh, trading house. Um, they sent me to Russia to open a representative office at the time. So we were doing everything from buying shiploads. I was doing everything from buying shiploads of, say, chicken legs from Chile, or you know, shiploads of uh, butter from New Zealand. Uh, it was a very interesting time because you, it, it, it's you were buying on the spot market, yeah, uh, hoping to sell at a profit. Uh, the market could move either way. Um, but there was also the, the currency. So if you didn't make a margin on the, the actual commodity, you generally could make it on the currency. So it was a very interesting business. Yeah. Um, and it was, was really that here, was Patrick? Like, was that, that in was Ireland? In the U no, it was in the UK and Russia. Okay. So I, I, I set up a representative office in Russia. And then, um, what was it, like 20 years ago, uh, LVMH, which is the, uh, for people that don't know, it's called Louis Vuitton Moet Tennessee, um, the largest luxury goods brand in the in group in the world, uh, contacted me. They were looking for somebody to to run their Russian uh, operation. Yeah. And I think I was only 27 at the time. Um, <clears throat> And I had so much fun, to be honest, in Russia for the previous three years. I was just worn out. I knew yeah. if I gave another three years to this, uh, I probably wouldn't come back from Russia. Right. And uh, so I said to them, I love the brands. I love the opportunity, but uh, uh, thank you, but no. And then they said, well, would you actually come and work for us in Paris? You know, base yourself in Paris and run Central Eastern Europe from there. And I said, absolutely. So that's where it all started. I started initially managing Hennessy Cognac in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, I then, what did I do next? I was then moved to Asia, uh, looking after the champagne portfolio for LVMH. Uh, so that's like Moe Chandon, Vucco, Dom Perignon, Krug, uh, Le Grand Dame, et cetera. And after Asia, I was appointed international director for a very niche champagne brand within LVMH called Runart. Okay. Um, I was also running the UK at that time. And once that finished, they sent me back to Russia. So a second tour, like again, going to three, the full 360 yeah. uh, to set up, set up a subsidiary for the group there. Um, Moa Tennessee at the time, LVMH was in partnership with a guy called Mark Kaufman. You might have heard him like Kaufman Vodka, um, but basically he sold his business to Russian Standard um, and it triggered a call option 
to to set up our own business in in Russia. Um, <clears throat> so just to give you a timeline on this, like from start to finish, this was like 15 years. Uh, yeah. So I did a number of roles from, you know, area management, regional management, uh, sales, marketing, general management. I even did some mergers, acquisitions uh, during the time. So it was quite a, a, a rounded experience, I'd say. I had a fantastic time. Yeah. But the, the interesting thing, Sergio, is that moving from a business in commodities where everything is turnover mm -hmm. and low turnover to a business which is all about profit and massive profit, yeah. massive profit margins. Uh, most of the brands <clears throat> I worked with were looking at generally 78, 80% profit margin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that was a big eye opener for me because uh, you know I, I, I had to change this mindset from turnover and get get it out you know, quick and dirty to, to actually building a long term sustainable business so you're dealing you were dealing with probably less than one percent margin in the commodities trade to yeah 78 uh, i mean i i've heard discussions amongst certain, some luxury brands actually more in the perfumery business <coughs> uh, and a lot of the luxury concept comes from largely from branding and packaging you know um, mm -hmm. and i mean what defines I mean, you better than anybody will have a, a great understanding of what is luxury and what it is that uh, defines luxury and attracts people to it. <clears throat> I remember once uh, in a roundabout way of answering your question, I think you might be interested. I remember talking years ago to the head of Louis, Louis Vuitton and we were talking about, I was asking him about market research you know yeah. what kind of market research do, do, do you do and he looked at me almost like in horror and he said what do you mean market research he said market research is asking people what they want he mm -hmm. said we surprise people we inspire people by things they don't expect so they try to the find a market yeah that was a real revelation for me that you know you don't necessarily know what you want until mm -hmm. it's actually you know in front of you but one of, one, of the, one of the things I think I learned from LVMH searches is that, you know, any successful brand is based on three pillars, uh, constructed on three pillars. The first is the excellence of the product. So the product itself has to be outstanding. Okay. <clears throat> there needs to be no question about that. The second is that the visual identity in terms of you refer to packaging has to be stunning. Yeah. catching the eye and the third element is there has to be a compelling brand story okay so there has to be something behind the brand behind the product and the actual label to mm -hmm. to engage people yeah so that's the storytelling thought, aspect of brand building yeah. if you like <clears throat> yeah. and that, that was that was really instrumental for me starting off on my own because uh Again, it's funny when, once you're working in a large corporation, you have a lot of people to do stuff for you. Yeah. Um, I didn't even know how to organize transport. I didn't know how what excise was. Um, all of these things that you you just kind of learn on 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 foot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a large organization, I suppose you are somewhat distant from what might be happening, you know, on the ground. But I mean, you had a very senior role and obviously a big responsibility with L the L VMH. You you started Origin Spirits in 2013. Was that? Yes. What was the decision behind that? I mean, what made you <clears throat> jump from a, a life of luxury, if you like, and uh, a lot of, I'm sure you had a great job, actually. I'm sure, and all the travel, all the perks, uh, and independence and you know a good career ahead of you what made you chuck that in i think i think it was a combination of factors um i think first of all um the, the, the i suppose the evolution of my career with lvmh it meant that i was more behind the desk the uh 
you know, the, the, the more the years went by. Uh, one thing I really loved always in, you know, particularly in, in, in spirits and wine or uh, is getting in front of people, you know, sharing the passion you have, sharing the story of the brands. Um, and that's something that I used to really get up for in the morning uh, that I could get really excited about. And um, I think it was, you know, the more uh, the evolution of my career, it meant that I was a little bit more removed from that. Right. Uh, okay. Because technically there was other people doing it. But, and I did get out a, a bit, but maybe not to the extent I wanted. <clears throat> but it also gave me, um, I think, an insight into, I suppose, Serge, it gave me confidence in knowing what I liked and what I didn't like, you know, because yeah. sometimes when you're, you start in the drinks industry, uh, um, you're, you're almost uh, lost for words and ter in terms of, do I have credibility to say I like something? And if somebody asks, why can you explain? <clears throat> and the one thing I really got uh, from my time at LVMH was, I developed a love for wine, for champagnes, yeah. for brown spirits in general, so cognac and particularly whiskey. Uh, we launched Ardbeg and Glenmorangie while I was in Russia. Okay. Um, and this is how the whole thing started because you can imagine, if, I didn't, have you ever been to Russia? No, not yet. Okay. So the one thing people will realize when they get to Russia and maybe know that before is that there, you know, the, the the national drink is vodka. Yeah. So you cannot get away from vodka in Russia. So whether it's a celebrating a business meeting or going out meeting friends or even at dinner, there's a traditional couple of shots of vodka, even at people's homes before they, they start dinner. And <clears throat> I was, there was a disconnect within me about this whole thing because everything I loved about the wine or spirits, you know, this, the, the brands that I found that had character or complexity or, and so on. I just didn't understand why people were drinking vodka. Yeah. And I kind I thought, you know, it started as an, an initial just plug at the back of my head that wouldn't it be interesting to create a vodka uh, with flavor? Yeah. Because for me, vodka was neutral. It had no flavor, no aroma. Um, and I suppose in a selfish way, living in Russia, I was kind of always dreaming of, wouldn't it be great to have a vodka that I could like? Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it started. And. The, the one interesting thing, which I don't say to many people, and maybe a lot of people who've lived abroad will understand this, that the further you go for our, from Ireland, the more relevant Ireland becomes. Okay. So, yeah. you know, you know, living, living abroad, you kind of remember the little things and you're attracted to the things that you don't necessarily take advantage of when you're actually living in the country. Yeah, more and, Irish than the Irish is one of the sayings they have, you know, the further, yeah. you know... Look at the states. Look at a huge interest in Irish uh, culture now in Russia. Also, there is, yeah, and I think you know, um, I, I would say in general, uh, you know, Ireland isn't. Let's be fair; isn't known as uh, like within the, the mass population of uh, as a country. But I think everything that is known about Ireland is very positive. You know, people know that uh, we make whiskey, that we're, we make kind of natural, good food products. Yes. Um, yeah. Russia is very strict on the entry requirements of any food or drink. And so I think once you're, once you have your brands in there, it's always um, a, almost a credibility stamp to the yeah. Russian consumer. Yeah. And uh also, I think while I was there, it's changed a lot now, but while I was in Russia, there was almost a stamp of anything that comes from outside Russia has to be good. So mixed with the 
the credibility that Ireland had as a, as a natural kind of food producer, food and drink producer, I yeah. think bode very well with the consumer there. Yeah. So you had the concept of, of uh, well, I suppose you, you decided to, did you decide to jump ship and then came up with the idea or you had the idea and then moved? <clears throat> Again, this is my character, uh, Sergius. I can't do things like in tandem. Right. Okay. Um, I either give a hundred percent to something or I don't. Yeah. So I I, I left LVMH and uh, once I did, I could then start really investing my my brain into in, in into um, creating or bringing this idea forward. Um, yeah. yeah. And into reality. Yeah. I. I was just going back thinking again at the, at the early days and, and I said you did well let's actually first let's show the products that uh, that you 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 do have in your portfolio and we're, one of the things we're going to do today is introduce a, a new release that you'll be bringing out in a couple of weeks so that's yes. speckle here well I guess we can surmise it is whiskey but we won't say what yet but um so you, you brought out the well. Firstly, was the one in the center is the Calic vodka, and that's a, a malted uh, vodka. The one beside <laughs> yeah, it then is the uh, peated vodka. Is that right? Yes. To the right, and then the Ornabrac gin, followed by the Curragh whiskey. So perhaps you want to take us through the evolution of each of these and. Uh, Calic was first, so maybe tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so you remember what I was saying about my time in Russia and how I hated vodka, and yeah. essentially I wanted to try and create a vodka that I could drink and I could like. And in almost a selfish hope that if I liked it, other people would like it too. So, <clears throat> but. As I said, once you're abroad, you kind of look at Ireland in a different way. And one of the things I felt that was a huge asset to the brand Ireland as such was the diversity of its agricultural product produce. Yeah. And of that, I think, you know, particularly in the drinks industry, everybody will agree that Irish malted barley is among the best in the world. I remember talking to Paul Packold from this first journal years ago, and he said, wow, Irish malted barley is by far the best. Mm -hmm. So I think we have, um, I, it, it kind of reminds me, Sergius, of the Champagne region. You know, why yeah. is the grapes in Champagne so uh, revered? Is because they're probably one of the most northerly lying vineyards in Europe. Uh, they get just as much as rain as we do in Ireland, and it takes longer for the actual grapes to to evolve. So, all of that creates that uniqueness uh, of the uh, the three grape varieties which are used in Champagne, and it's not a million miles away from malted barley because malted barley in Ireland actually has to grow a couple of months longer than you know continental barley, uh, but all of that gives it that. I think uniqueness mm -hmm. uh, and special element. So that's definitely one of the, I, I think, you know, contributing factors to, uh, to, 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 to what Ireland is so good about. <clears throat> so specifically on Calac, <clears throat> uh, Calac is probably one of the first single malt vodkas in the world. And <clears throat> you might hear a lot of tonight saying we're first or near first. Yeah. We're not trying to be the first. It was more thinking outside the box and trying to be as uh, taking an avant-garde approach to, to, to our, to, I suppose, to the offering within the industry. Um, with Calac, what I wanted to do, Sergius, was not just create a vodka, but I wanted to bring the spirit of the grain out. Yeah. So there's only three ingredients in Calac. So there is the malted barley. There's the yeast for the fermentation and the water, the oro water to cut it. Yeah. <clears throat> All of the flavor and Calac is well known around the world for having this incredible, almost whiskey-esque flavor. 
Uh, that's why people call it the whiskey drinker's vodka. Yeah. Uh, and I'm conscious as well tonight because <clears throat> we're, you know, we're on a whiskey uh, platform. Uh, so I think it's very interesting for most of the whiskey, you know, uh, a, a lot of our followers are both whiskey and vodka drinkers, which is quite unusual. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so because of, of what I said, you know, in terms of the the kind of the label we got in the US, particularly about being the whiskey drinkers vodka, <clears throat> it got us thinking and saying, well, maybe we could push this a little bit further. And, yeah. you know, what else do we do well in Ireland is peat. Just to, to sorry, um, <clears throat> uh, one important point I forgot to mention is that, you know, what Calac is, it's it's actually made like a whiskey. So the base is the same as uh, what a whiskey would be. So is but it quadruple we, distilled or something like that you were saying? <clears throat> it's quadruple distilled uh, because for a vodka, you have to, there's no legislation in whiskey on what, what you need to distill to, but in vodka, it has to be distilled to 96% alcohol. Right, okay. So thus the a quadruple distillation plus there had to be some modification to the uh, to the stills in terms of flux etc to to actually achieve that uh, <clears throat> it actually took us three years interesting you'll enjoy this we could have actually made a whiskey in the time we <laughs> made Calac. Um, we had some really good team uh, on board we 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 joined up with um, <clears throat> west cork distillers john o'connell and co uh, to produce for us they were incredible. They they loved the madness, uh, yeah. I suppose, of the idea. And um, we brought on, uh, you might know, Dr. Jim Swan, uh, yeah. who sadly passed away a couple of years ago. He was working on it. We had Ian Wisniewski, one of the leading vodka gin experts. That's in a Europe. big name, yeah. And then we had uh, Roy Court, uh, formerly of Middleton. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a really, really good dream team. Um, and yeah, so I think we're trying to do something which had never been done before in terms of bringing the alcohol, creating a spirit, almost in the spirit of whiskey uh, in Ireland. And that's why it took so long. <clears throat> yeah, I remember trying to first and, and always had the concept or the, in my head that vodka didn't really have flavor. It was pretty bland and so forth. And uh, I did. I did say to you. I, I remember at the time. I have very specific memories of it, actually, and I don't know why. I think it's because I just didn't expect it to taste nice. I really didn't, you know. And I was pleasantly surprised, which was great. But how important is it that you stand out and be different in the markets today? <clears throat> I think it's incredibly important, uh, Sergius, but I think you need also need to be careful that you're not you don't become gimmicky. Yes. In other words, doing something to put yourself out there that you're doing something different. Everything we try to do is what what I like to say is all of our products are this fusion of tradition and innovation. So taking elements from the past and from you know, the history of distillation in Ireland or our produce and maybe taking a different uh, stab at it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's very, very important um, to to stand out. And I, I think one of the things which kind of, you, you know, you're showing the photo there of the the five, um, six, six products. There's yeah. one thing they all have in common. Um, they all have the same DNA running through them. So each one is made from Irish malted barley from the southeast of Ireland. Each one is copper pot distilled. Yeah. So, and the interesting thing before we even went into whiskey is that we had three products. So Calac single malt vodka, Calac peat cask single malt vodka, and Ornebrag single malt gin. Uh, we had three single malt products, which none of which were whiskey. But how so did that, you get them to such a high alcohol level? Because they have to be, don't they, to when you're producing them. So is it the fourth it, distillation that does it? It's the fourth distillation plus a lot of reflux, yeah, which gets it to 96. 
And traditionally, um, vodka is done in column stills, no? <clears throat> Correct. So, yeah, this is a really interesting subject because um, traditionally, vodka is judged on its pureness. So, mm -hmm. pureness. If you break break what that down, break down what it means, it means that it doesn't have any flavor or aroma. Yeah. <clears throat> The column still is far more efficient than a pot still to distill any spirit. So you can get it up to a very high alcohol level uh, quickly. Yeah. <clears throat> I sometimes kind of compare a column still and a pot still to almost like imagine you're in a, in, in a cottage in Ireland and you've got an open fire in the living room yeah. and an electric radiator in the bedroom. Oh. Now the electric radiator does the job of heating and it'll heat up very quickly. Mm -hmm. But in the living room, that open fire, it gives the all of that character. It's much more about it's much more than the heat that it gives. Yeah. It's much slower. You need to nurture it. And that's why I think it's an interesting analogy between the two. Yeah. I know the Kalak vodka is it's very much a premium product. Uh, I don't know the pricing exactly. Uh it's it's not cheap for a vodka, but I, I suppose you have it on the premium shelves, and and you've succeeded with that product in the home of vodka, which is Russia. So, mm -hmm. how did you go about that? And how was that achieved? And what did you take from those lessons when you went to create the whiskey? <clears throat> I think. Um... A lot of people said to us, you know, when we launched Kalak, uh, our single malt vodka, first of all, that we were maybe a year or two ahead of the curve. Um, not that I'm Nostradamus, but I, I kind of felt all along that there was going to be a shift towards in terms of what people think and what people search out in terms of products. Yes. Um, I thought that the whole element of the actual product rather than the brand was going to become a lot more important. So people are actually searching for this savory or this taste sensation or experience. Um, they want to know uh, what the, you know, what the provenance is, what the ingredients are used, how it's made, who it's made by, who's behind it. Uh, are you ethical or not? Uh, yeah. Are you natural or not? So there's all these kind of things came into play but in the you last saw 10 them years, which emerged before they really emerged. Was that, or did you see them in other sectors and you thought, well, look, this is bound to happen in the drink sector or were you just literally going on a hunch? I saw it happening in food. Yeah. And that's why I thought it was definitely going to happen in, in spirits. Um, because the, the other thing which is very good, Sergius, as you probably know, is that, uh, you know, you know, I would imagine that the, the majority of Irish spirits producers, um, they're very much in the premium game. Yeah. Um, and it's not all about the quantity you drink, but the quality you drink. So, so consumers are also drinking less, but savoring more. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, that's why they're spending a little bit more money on products that they identify with or that they like, um, and I think that's uh, that's very important. People like to be surprised. Um, again, do you remember what I said about the three pillars of the brands? Uh, yeah. You know, product quality, visual identity, and story. Mm -hmm. They, I think, that is just as element, evident today as it ever was. Um, yeah, but there, there is, is this huge. element. Yeah, branding is huge, but there, it it has to stack up. Yeah. You know, you can't you can't pull the wool over people's eyes anymore. Not that we never did, uh, uh, but I think it's all about just getting that uh, expressing what you do well, um, and how that how your product is different. Yeah. So to answer the second part of your question, how did that influence the whiskey? There was just one element. There was one kind of little story in the me in the middle, which I'd like to maybe touch on. Yeah, 
is our gin, which is Ornabrac uh, single malt gin. The interesting thing about Ornabrac is that Ornabrac is a phonetic spelling of the word Ornabraca in Irish, which means malted barley. Okay. So <clears throat> we don't say it on the bottle, but essentially what Ornabrac is, it's uh, it's a four time distilled uh, base spirit, which is essentially Calac single malt vodka. Yeah. And then we infuse it with, with five botanicals and distill it a fifth time. So mm -hmm. what was interesting about Ornabrac, and you, you said to me at the beginning, uh, I'd never do a whiskey. I said to numerous people at numerous times over the last few years, I, over my dead body, will I ever do a gin? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the, the reason was, you know, I think most people in the industry will know that uh, the gin market, um, people are saying, when is it going to burst? Uh, is it too saturated? Um, I think there's over 80 Irish gins at the moment, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it's a very, very crowded marketplace. And uh, I was kind of thinking that, you know, can we maybe look at this another way? And, you know, almost deconstructing what gin is and what people don't really realize with gin is that gin is essentially... Uh, a botanically infused vodka mm -hmm. so that what actually whatever is in the bottle you probably have between 90 between 90 and 95 percent base spirit which is infused with botanicals um nobody talks about the actual base spirit everybody talks about the botanicals they're using yes. so we took a different approach and we said look let's celebrate the base spirit with Man. this incredible single malt uh, base spirit with uh amazing character and uniqueness and flavor um and let's try and pick the botanicals one by one that actually gets on with the base yeah because in calac for your listeners that don't know calac um it's very creamy it's kind of biscuity almost digestive biscuit uh, aromas you've got aromas of vanilla dark chocolate uh, a little bit of rich uh, kind of candied fruit as well. So a lot of, and, and interestingly, if anybody was listening, just joined and said, I'm talking about a vodka, they'd say, no, no, that, that's a No, it, it really is vodka redefined. I mean, if somebody's expecting to drink this, I mean, I almost think it's a new make, but at a, high, at a fourth distillation, yeah, it's incredibly smooth, which is good. You know, it's it's so a lot of people actually say to me, Serge, it's it's, it's actually bottled at forty percent alcohol, but yes. people find it is it's a lot let less a lot less of a kick of alcohol. Yeah. Um. So with 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 Ornabrac, uh, really want to kind of celebrate that and almost bring uh, that what we call our that DNA back into the product. You know, that malted barley, that single malt. Um, and celebrate, and 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 that was uh, uh, Ornabrac is doing incredibly well around the world, from um, the North America to Europe to Asia, uh, because people are uh, they're identifying with you know what it is, what it mm -hmm. says on the bottle, but particularly how it tastes, um, and I suppose all of this. And again, if you'd asked me at the print works when I was doing Calac, what was the future, Patrick? And I would have said, you know, I don't know, Sergius, or it, it's going to be just Calac. Um, you know, things evolve, opportunities evolve. And I remember we were at uh, with our sales manager, Stephen Randalls, uh, in Provine, it was about three years ago in Germany. And we had all these people coming to the stand. So imagine we had two incredible single malt vodkas and a single malt gin yeah. in a sea of Irish whiskey brands around us. And everybody was coming up to us and saying, uh, oh, do you not have a whiskey? Yeah. And we said, no. And they kind of walked away. And I remember having a chat that evening, with the first night with Stephen, and we were saying, um, yeah, it would, you know, Steve was asking me, would you, would you ever consider doing a whiskey? And I said, no, Stephen, 
just everything has been done. Yeah. Um, you know, the different types of casking, uh, different types of barrels used, uh, whether it's single mall, pot still, uh, blends, it's, it's all been done. I said, I, I, we just can't find this. Uh, if we want to follow through that same kind of thread to everything we've done up to now, uh, yeah. it just doesn't stack up. So I, I remember saying to Stephen that night, if we can find the right idea that both celebrates that let's say that kind of valorizes the brand or the product um you know rather than just doing something for the sake of it doing but but actually bring somebody on a almost a sensory journey into something else yeah and that's when we started thinking about the whiskey yeah. One of the things I think when you're in the industry, and again, when I was, I mentioned at the beginning when I was at LVMH, and um, just for me and maybe other people are different, but I find it very difficult to 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 juggle different jobs at the same time. I either give something a hundred percent or not. Yeah. Um, and I think once you started looking at the whiskey, um, I, I think I was almost uh, too narrow-minded. We were looking at, you know, what is on the ground in Ireland? What is the terroir, as the French say? Yeah. You know, is it the the different types of barley or grain or turf or, or so on? And, you know, sometimes when you take a step back, you think that there's also other elements that are famous in Ireland and that are just to celebrate it but then not necessarily from the land, but also from the sea yeah, or from the coast. And um, that's when we started thinking about, uh, you know, investigating seaweed. No, I'd say investigating because we had no idea if it worked. And to be perfectly honest, we had initially an idea to extend the ornabrack, our gin, uh, with... Uh, you know, using some seaweed as botanicals, but that never happened. And I remember talking to Stephen that night, that night, and or just maybe a couple of days later, and uh, we were saying, "Oh, remember what we're doing about the seaweed and gin? You know, would it be interesting to see if we could maybe experiment with whiskey?" Yeah. So <clears throat> I think nothing happened for a while. Uh, I remember I was back in Paris and we had, uh, I bought a load of different types of different seaweed to experiment with. Yeah. I remember uh, at the backyard uh, or in the, on the terrace at the back, uh, I started, uh, you know, barbecuing wooden chips uh, with overlaying them with seaweed. Yeah. So to try and infuse the, uh, the seaweed flavor into the wood chips. And then I basically put the wood chips into different bottles of uh, single malt whiskey for a couple of days to see was there any impact whatsoever in terms of flavor. Yeah. And there was a lot happening, but, uh, you know, doing something almost in your back. By the way, I nearly burnt down the neighbor's <laughs> tree. Uh, yeah. There was a bit of one of the barbecue things caught fire. But um, so I remember again talking to Stephen and saying, yeah, I think there's definitely something here. We need to scale this up. We need to try maybe try a, a cask. Um, and that's how it all started. Um, I had tried, I trialed about five or six different seaweed varieties. That's what I was going to ask you. I mean, obviously, when you're doing this um, kind of experimentation, there have to be many failures as well before you hit the, the mark. Definitely, it's. Um, um, I think the, the one thing of the, that kind of like micro experimentation I was doing here was to show was was there actually a flavor impact, or mm -hmm. because there there has to be something that will add value or character to the to the actual product. Otherwise, it's not worth doing just for the in, for the sake of the label. 
Um, certain seaweeds were uh, reacted in different ways, but I think it was much more once we actually got down to West Cork and started experimenting with the casks um, that we could really, really see, you know, on a almost, I don't like uh, an artisan stroke industrial way, how we could actually uh, scale these up. Yeah. And I remember the first time, w one thing we were in, in agreement with was that the kombu uh, seaweed, which is a brown seaweed variety. Uh, which is was, what's behind your, be, your first release was the kombu exactly. seaweed. Yeah. Yeah. Which so is what's which in my glass. Would be, <laughs> exactly. I, I, I've got one here too. Okay, well, Cheers, <laughs> The incredible, the interesting thing about seaweed is that um, in its raw state, it can be quite kind of fishy or salty, um, you know, when you pick it up from the sea. But when it's actually roasted, mm -hmm. it gives off a very different flavor. So the kombu, for example, um it gives off these beautiful kind of toffee raisin aromas uh you know roasted coffee um dark chocolate um but always always with with this kind of umami uh, yeah. you know what i mean by umami uh, element at, at the back uh, and that i thought we felt was just incredible the coffee because... note actually is very interesting i mean i really do pick up on that and it is it's ground mm. coffee beans as opposed to just coffee. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I definitely agree. Um, but you see, the thing what, what, if, if you if you kind of deconstruct Irish whiskey for, you know, um, in my view, and I'm not talking as an expert in any way. I just love Irish whiskey. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that stands out to me with Irish whiskey is this kind of um, sweetness that mm -hmm. you don't have maybe in scotch or you know other whiskies um that smoothness as well um but if we stay on the, the kind of the sweetness i think one of the interesting things is that we felt that the the seaweed was bringing in this beautiful kind of umami kind of uh, vegetal kind of maritime uh, element which helped offset the sweetness to create a yeah. really interesting complexity or balance should i say uh, between that kind of sweetness and savory elements uh, of, of, the, of the whiskey. So <clears throat> how we did it, Sergius, is we we uh, we went to a, an incredible company up on the Clare Coast, um, yeah. just near uh, by Quilty, the Talty family, so wild Atlantic seaweeds. Um, <clears throat> They farm uh, organically, you know, sustainably. Uh, it's all natural. Uh, so they dry, they pick and they dry the seaweed for us, um, and then we. So I bring think the here seaweed. we have some of the shots of. Yeah. Uh, now that might not be kombu. <clears throat> that might be a different seaweed, but uh, certainly uh, it looks beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, so the the great thing about the uh, Evan and the family, they, they're all involved. So the grandfather to the son to the grandchildren and they're, if I'm not mistaken, third generation. So like the, they're like forefathers have been doing the same thing um, yeah. for a long time. And uh, <clears throat> we just love the, 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 that natural sustainable way because when I say sustainable, um, Sergius is that when they harvest the seaweed, they don't pull it up by the root like a lot All of right. people would do. So they, they basically take off maybe half what they need. So allowing the, the, the plant to grow back. Yeah. Um, the probably the West coast of Ireland has some, probably the purest waters in Europe because there is no, there's very little traffic, you know, uh, yeah, between Gulf that Stream and, and all and the rest. US. Yeah. So um, it's an incredible kind of micro ecosystem, you know, for growing uh, amazing products. Um, and, you know, personally, I was always just wowed by uh, the quality of, of the products that they were harvesting. So 
Once they dry, if you see here, go back a slide. That's the drying. Yeah. So what? They, yeah. So what they do is they dry the seaweed to get it the ultimate, the optimum moisture level. Then they pack it um, into bales, and we then bring it down to West Cork. And what we do then is um, <clears throat> we we char the exactly because. Why did you have that photo? So what's different the way, about the way we char the casks compared to the traditional way of charring is that um, most people in the whiskey industry will know that you know that when you're charring uh, industrially casks, you can char between can take maybe between ten and thirty seconds to do you know at very high heat. So what we've done is we've taken uh, the seaweed um the combo in this case and we put it into the cask in 500 gram lots okay we use a blowtorch to get a lighting and then we seal the the cask and allow the smoke to infuse uh into the wood right and then we roll it so you have this effect of smoke coming up you know to the upper level of the cask plus that kind of light charring of the burning just below the flame and so these are virgin casks, american so. casks are they they're sorry yeah exactly they're virgin american oak casks yeah and so the charring of each cast that so we repeat this operation every 500 grams five times so we 200 2.5 kilos of seaweed that goes into the cask um and then once the cask is finished it takes maybe about yeah about a half an hour 25 to 30 minutes to do each cask and then we uh, we obviously uh, eject all the uh, the burnt seaweed from the cask, and then add uh, single malt Irish whiskey. Right. And what we felt is that the optimal time is uh, three months. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people asked me. Somebody asked me recently why was it not four or five months. And I think what we found is that after three months. Uh, we felt that the the flavor uh, injection from the wood or the seaweed into the whiskey um, was optimal. Right. After the three months, the whiskey started taking much more of the caramel notes from the Virgin American Oak, so you're which we didn't necessarily city, want. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we we kind we kind of pushed it as far as we could, and. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we felt three months is 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 optimal, but the one and the it's one the thing same process through. for so this is the the for the kombu. You brought out something new that uses something different. It was it the same process for that? Exactly Similar? the same. Exactly the same. Um, uh, the the one thing what I was just going to add is that you know even when we say three months. It really depends on when you actually put the cask down, um, because obviously in the winter months we find that there's less uh, interaction between, say, because it's colder in the in, in the cask houses, there's less interaction between the wood and the uh, seaweed and the whiskey than there would be maybe um, in the summer months. Yeah. So it's something we you know there's no rule of thumb. We just we keep. Going back every month or every few weeks and and uh, uh, testing it. So there's one question from James up in Sleevele. Do you rechar the cask after each refill? Um, we what we do is we we re, we uh, we strip the cask after each uh, refill mm -hmm. and then rechar it. Right. Okay. Uh, we try. We we tried it once, just uh, recharring um, the actual cask after the first, and we felt that the the result wasn't exactly what we what we wanted. Okay. So so we stripped we stripped down the so the STR process, uh, and then rechar it. Just to so just to what, see if I've understood correctly. So initially, you take triple distilled single malt. You put mm -hmm. it into a first fill bourbon cask, and then you right. put it in a, a seaweed charred cask 
and matured there for three months. Is that it, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. There's a lot of work. A lot of work goes into it. What age is the, is the single malt when it uh, goes <clears throat> into the virgin cows? Uh, the, the single malt is quite young. So it's yeah. three, between three and four years old. Okay. Um, which we find actually was a, an advantage because we, we actually trialed uh, some older uh, malt, but we felt the younger malt was more of a blank canvas to more receptive really, to the uh, flavor, the receptive to the, the flavors of the, the seaweed. Yeah. I remember um, it, it was uh, Michael Fogarty gave me a sample and he said, you know, try this. And and he said, what do you make of it? And I said, I said, it's interesting. And I, and I remember saying, I don't know if I said I liked it or not, but I said, it's interesting. And I said, what is it? And he says, have a guess. Uh, and you know, it definitely stood out as being different. And I just, it put me, I, I wrecked my head trying to figure out what it might've been. I didn't get there, you know? And I think Stephen then gave me a sample and said, look, this is, uh, this is seaweed. And I said, oh. It kind of made a little sense, but it doesn't. Certainly, this one, the first release he did, it didn't come across as an overpowering sense of, you know, seaweed. You'd expect to get brine and salt and you know, uh, all those kind of flavors that you would expect from the uh, from the ocean. But it wasn't. It wasn't that at all. It was a very subtle back note. <clears throat> Exactly, and that's one of the uh, the things which we thought we'd always try to achieve is is as you said this balance, mm -hmm. um, because I think anybody who knows our products, you know, whether it's Kalak or Ornabrak or Kurak, they're not they don't kind of punch you in the face in terms yes. of flavor. They're, they we like to think that they're um, they're quite well balanced between flavors and. The one thing I always look for in the spirit, and which I try to to achieve in in, in our own, is this uh, subtlety and elegance of flavors. So there's no one that's kind of overpowering, um, and that's why I think Curric is a really good example because, uh, as I said, it's this really nice balance between the the almost the traditional Irish whiskey kind of sweetness and smoothness, but bringing in this almost uh, savory umami maritime character. I mean, it's really weird because um, I'm drinking the one, the the kombu one, which is a brown seaweed. It's a brown kelp seaweed. Now, I just read that, so I don't know what kelp is different to seaweed, but I'm drinking it at 60%. So I think this was one of the founders cast ones, which I managed to get my hands on, but... I, I, do you know what I get off it? Custard cream biscuits is one of the flavors I get off it. I just, you know, I, interesting, yeah, yeah, and I do get that coffee note as well. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a sixty percent. It it definitely doesn't drink like a sixty percent. Now, mm. um, I don't know. Do do uh, Sergio? Do you get any of the kind of the maritime umami notes from it? Only at the end. It, not at the very beginning, mm. and, and more on the on the back of the tongue than I do on the on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, you know. So, and maybe so, that's just me. <clears throat> I mean, how many failures were there before you got it right? Were there many? <sighs> well, there's. Uh, let's put it this way: there's. <clears throat> there was so many that we've lost count. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, but you know, I, th I think once you're doing something, um, you know, w when you're kind of breaking new ground, and <clears throat> we have to remember that Curac uh, is, is the first whiskey in the world ever to be influenced uh, by seaweed. It's amazing when you think uh, about it. You know that nobody came up with this before. <clears throat> It's not it, well. Again, for me, it's not a question of being the first or, or being the best. It's 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 it's. I think it, I I just love this um, the energy from see actually seeing if something will work or not. Yeah. Um, 
and as I said, there's been a lot of failures which nobody knows about uh, behind, it, you know, that we would never bring to market because we just weren't happy with the quality. Um, but then you have these gems like Karak that suddenly come up almost like this uncut diamond and you just say, wow, yeah, you know, yeah. that actually surpasses your, your expectations of what you, what you think uh, could be possible. Yeah, um, yeah. And the, the one thing about Karak, which I, <clears throat> I'm, 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 I'm big into food and, uh, you know, I, I know quite a lot of chefs and like spending time, you know, reading recipes and discovering new types of food. Um, I think Kurok is, is um, a product which works incredibly well with food um, because it got, it's, got so many, it's, it's got so many different layers of complexity that you can almost pick and choose what actually works uh one of the things which uh i think works incredibly well is like uh is something simple well sounds a bit good but you know if you can get it fresh you know freshly grilled octopus mm -hmm. uh with with curric is just stunning yeah yeah, yeah. um um i mean was so that the intention was the intention to try and pair it up with foods or was it are you did you just want a versatile whiskey as well? Or, I mean, I, I can imagine this sort of uh, whiskey with the sea influence of the sea being really attractive to, to the Asian market and to the, the foodie market, if you like. <clears throat> exactly. We have, um, we're, I, I think one of the kind of biggest kind of growth areas for us at the moment is uh, Asia. Yeah. Uh, not just for Kurok, but for the other brands. Um, I think Kurok is really standing out that in that uh, they have a, a bit like Ireland, a, a big food culture, and uh, but more like in France, that where they like to pair food with spirits or wines uh, yes. more than we do. Um, and particularly in China, because, you know, particularly when you look at the south of China, it, it, it's all about uh, first and foremost eating, eating well, and then choosing what you want to drink based on what you're eating, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. which is a little bit different to our culture. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've, we're really excited about the, the opportunities uh, in, in Asia at the moment. Um, we've got quite a big following so far with the... Uh, a lot of the kind of top restaurants yeah and bar michelin star restaurants etc and uh so yeah we're really excited to see what's going to come with it we're we're working at the moment on more kind of advanced kind of food pairing yes um, suggestions for not just correct but but all the brands cocktails and, uh, that's cocktails too yeah i think um <clears throat> The, I, I, I tell you one thing, and again, this the difficulty of the pandemic, Sergius, is that we haven't been able to get out. Most of the cocktail, cocktail suggestions that we've had uh, up to now have been the result of Stephen or I or brand ambassadors in the past going out, sitting behind a bar and uh, basically talking to talk with the bartenders and coming up with ideas, which we haven't been able to do. Yeah. One thing which I think works incredibly well uh, with Kurok that when when I drink it other than meat uh, is actually with green tea, chilled green tea. It's that earthiness of the yeah. green tea just in a in a highball. Okay. Um, or, or or even uh, Stephen was saying recently he's been he's tried it with green tea kombucha that works really well as well. Um. Uh, with oolong chilled oolong tea as well i mean they're okay they're asian type inspirations but i just think it they work uh, so well with Kurok. yeah so <clears throat> to answer your question it's not that it's 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 still so new and uh, i remember even with Kalak or ornabrak it maybe took a year or two before we actually really uh were comfortable with the the whole flavor profile to be able to look at how we suggest to people in the industry who know uh, what mixed drinks are all about, you know, to you know, to say something with, with a degree of credibility. I think we're still far a little bit off on, on Kurok, 
but we do know that a lot of the Asian flavors just work incredibly well with it. Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of direction we're taking at the moment. Okay. Well, look, I mean, there's a great, I, I, I certainly think on the foodie side, it must be a huge market and I can, I can see it uh, being a huge success. Places like France and uh, Japan and Asia, and hopefully here too. I'm sure you're on the high shelf here, but let's, talk about what is happening today so officially you're unveiling something new do you want to tell us about your new release <clears throat> here and uh, perhaps a little bit about uh, what the inspiration for this was exactly so uh today you know we're revealing for the first time internationally and happy to do it with you sergius um the second release of Kurak, uh, which is a Wakami cask. Okay, so, <clears throat> so explain to our listeners, for those that don't know what so, the Wakami is. So the, uh, as you said, a kombu, uh, Kurak single malt Irish whiskey, Atlantic kombu seaweed cask is, the kombu is a brown seaweed. Yeah. In this case, uh, Wakami is a green seaweed it's the one thing that blew us away initially in our trials was what how different the kombu and the wakami were mm -hmm. bearing in mind we used the exact same single malt irish whiskey we used the exact same casks we charred them the same way the only difference was actually the seaweed that went into went into it and are they collected by the same uh, family the talty family they're Absolutely, they're all from the same uh, family. The difference with, with Wakami is it's a lot more precious. It's uh, it's rarer. It's a lot more seasonal. It's more expensive, a lot more expensive. Um, <clears throat> but it's, I think once it's actually, again, roasted, it gives off these very different flavors that you would actually be expecting uh, with with kombu, so <clears throat> the, the way I would I, I, the way I described it to somebody yesterday, Sergio, is it, it's almost like a crossroads between say an Irish whiskey and a Scotch. Right. So okay. you've got this so beautiful briny, briny brine. Yeah, you've got this briny kind of iron element, uh, which we don't have necessarily in the kombu. Um, you've got this again, this lovely kind of umami maritime sea salt. But again, on the nose, this almost the kind of rye cracker, uh, this caramel sweetness coming through. Um, and then on the on the on the palate, you've got uh, it's a it's more vegetal than the kombu. You've got again this kind of spiciness, this cracked pepper, um, this kind of oak spice. But it's almost like this. Uh, almost this white wine fruitiness that you would get say from almost the kind of Chardonnay, kind of rich Chardonnay style. Um, yeah. But but again, this kind of very complex buttery creaminess, like with butterscotch uh, elements coming through. Is it um, very different than else? to the uh, kombu overall? It's very different. It's very different, but I think Anybody, once you taste them side by side, you'll see that they, again the DNA that they're 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 brothers or sisters, yeah. whatever you want to say. Um, so you you have that um, uh, I suppose commonality in terms of the base and the the, the you know how how what the, you know how the whiskey is made, but it each one gives us off its own uh, character, yeah, uh, which yeah. is really interesting. So I, I think, you know, I remember talking to Stephen saying, you know, you know, how will this be received in the market? Um, and by the way, when we launched Kombu, first of all, we were actually uh, very surprised. We thought that we were going to get maybe 50% people liking it and 50% hating it. We probably got maybe 70% liking it and 30 hating it, which was fantastic news for us. Yeah, I mean, it's um, not one that you sit on the fence with either, is it? I mean, you, you either no, like it no. or you don't, and it is. And uh... and, 
and 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 basically, Sergio, that's that's how I roll because uh, you know I I I I very you know there, there aren't many whiskies that I say that are just okay. They're you know I only drink the whiskies I like. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know my palate is different to everybody else's, so it's it's only normal that you can't expect everybody to 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 like a product. And I actually prefer that. I actually prefer even if we had say 20 percent of people that were crazy about our watch the products than 80 percent of people saying it was okay mm -hmm. and that's why i think again you know looking at you know irish whiskey and you know we're we're we're, we're, we're great relationships with all the other distilleries and um i think we all have this common goal that we want to elevate irish whiskey uh you know to a level uh that's I think that's Declan asking, be. is it a three month finish on this one as well? It's three months finish on this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when is this going to be coming out? So it's it's actually being bottled as we speak. Okay. Um, so over the coming days, uh, we would hope to get it out to our distributors by the end of next week. Um, so we hope to have it in in trade on shelf by say the second week mm -hmm. of uh, July. It's quite limited. Um, I know you. The last one was two thousand eight hundred and eighty bottles. Uh, this is around the three thousand. Yes. And forty six percent ABV. Forty six percent ABV. Yes. Yeah. So we will have a second batch uh, coming out, but that's going to be in, a, in another couple of months. So um we're we're trying at the moment to um i don't like the word allocation we're not allocating but we're giving our you know core markets the the opportunity to express their interest yes um so that we don't leave them short so, th so it's priced at 60 euro or plan to go out at 60 euros all right correct yeah so the combo for reference is about 55 mm -hmm. in Ireland. So this will be uh, around 60. And is that because literally the cost of that seaweed is, is more and it's rare? The the cost is, yes, co cost is significantly more than the kombu. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so it, it's, yeah, we're just a little over 10% increase on the, uh, compared to the kombu pricing. So you did have a founder's version of this as well back around December was it and that yep. was a cast a strength version problem. of this okay very nice so, so I, I haven't tried that founders. one yet very nice and so yeah it, it's it, it I think it's uh the founders was I think the success of the founders which is long sold out now uh kind of really prompted us to to try and get out what we call our commercial release as soon as possible yeah um and i think the two are going to sit really well together um you know people are going to like one maybe not the other and that's fine that's what we all like yeah. um um but i suppose we want to I, so there's the two I'd like to i i i suppose the message sergio sergio that i'm really excited about is that uh the we're using two different seaweeds basically from the same area of Ireland on the yeah. same coast made in the exact same, you know, harvested in the same way, uh, charring the casks in the same way, using the same single malt whiskey, but you have like polar opposites in terms of how the whiskeys uh, resemble once they're finished. Yeah. And that to me is really exciting because I think it gives you, it really shows the diversity of the, eco maritime culture uh, of, of ireland and uh, what can be done with it yeah you so, talked about markets there just uh, where are your key markets for this obviously there will be an allocation of ireland as well but outside of ireland what are your key markets um the kind of the the principal markets in europe would be germany france uh, benelux yeah and then in asia we would have uh 
we're just starting in China at the moment. So China, Singapore, Taiwan, Japan. We've been in Japan okay. for the last year. <clears throat> and we're just kicking off uh, this summer in the US as well. Excellent. So previously in the US, we just had Calac and Ornabrack, but we're kicking off with Curac uh, in the US as well. And obviously, I imagine that's a big, uh, a big help having those previous brands, the Calic and the Ornabrack, available. It kind of <clears throat> makes it slightly easier to meet suppliers and so forth. Um, I, I think one thing, one thing we learned, Sergius, is that um, I think it's the advantage of sometimes of having a portfolio. You know, having a portfolio can have its uh, faults as well, but um, right. Okay. I think I, I, you know, I think what we found, particularly the Asian markets, which are very much more kind of brands first uh, yeah. markets, we found them previously difficult to penetrate with our white spirits or our vodka and gin. So we're using uh, Curac or whiskey very much as a door opener, but all of our partners are taking the other products as well. Okay. So in the existing markets, which were traditional white spirits markets. And we built up good relationships with our uh, with our importers that uh, they trust us. They know the, the traction they're getting on the brands, uh, so they're much more interested. You know, they're much more um, you know open to taking on uh, a whiskey to complement their portfolio. So it sure. works in both ways. The white spirits yeah. open some markets. The the brown other markets. Um, yeah. And again, that's what this one thing, you know, I'm glad we changed because when we started initially, I hate to say we'd all our big eggs in one basket, but we were maybe over focused on the US. Yeah. Um, I think now we've really good, quite a good balance between Europe, the US, and uh, Asia, uh, which is important both from, you know, in terms of brands kind of tendencies can go up and down uh, economies can be affected in different ways currencies and so on so yeah. it's maybe a safer approach uh, to the business you know longer term yeah yeah well look congratulations i'm looking forward to trying and uh, seeing how different it is going to be uh, in terms of how the business then what what's the future then for you know origin spirits have you is there another seaweed, perhaps, influence type of uh, whiskey, or w what are you looking to in the future? <clears throat> Sergio, you know, we're kind of like an iceberg. You just see what's on the top. Right. You know, sticking out of the water. There's a lot so of. So you're stuff not going to tell us, is basically what you're saying. No, I'm saying, you know, we've, we've uh, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of, well, not a lot. There's going to be, uh, you know, potentially one or two more seaweed varieties uh, on Curac to mm -hmm. explore the, those flavors, uh, one of which is quite well developed at the moment. The question of whether, whether we do it launch this year or it's probably going to be next year, but okay. we're still the jury's out on that. Uh, we're also looking at, um, uh, you know, maybe doing you know, using uh, again some other influences. You know, double casking. Uh, yeah. We uh, we're doing a series of kind of bespoke single cask uh, offerings at the moment uh, for some of our markets around the world, and um, that's given us a lot of inspiration um, to look at. You know, double casking for casking, which hasn't traditionally been thought of yeah. uh, in the whiskey world. So, so yeah, there's a lot of exciting stuff uh, I think coming out there. But I, you know, Sergio, as I said earlier, you know, nothing leaves until, unless we're happy with it. And we've had a couple of disasters, you know, not, yeah. it, that have never reached market. But things we thought that would would work, but didn't work. So, yeah. uh, and and I'm I'm not being coy and not answering the question. It's just that uh, you know, until we're actually sure that. The quality oh, I wouldn't is, expect what, what would... we want. What we want, uh, yeah. we won't. We won't talk about it. I mean, there's no but... sense in having innovation just for the sake of innovation, or being different just for the sake of being different. There has to be some quality element in there, and something that is uh, picked up on. So, uh, yeah. I don't expect. 
Well, certainly, look, I, it, it threw me by surprise when I was told it was a seaweed uh, influence. But I mean, when I was told it, then you can kind of see the links to it. Although, uh, would you say the wakami is more is more seaweed influenced than the kambu? <clears throat> Um, I'm the wrong person to ask, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I, I think I, I would say, I think the combo is probably a little bit more democratic. Okay. Um, I would imagine that the Wakami, I think will appeal to, I think hopefully the, the regular premium whiskey drinker. But I think what will really people that will really be excited are are are, are kind of collectors or uh, you know whiskey experts because I think you're you're getting flavor profiles uh, from the wakami which aren't necessarily classic in whiskey but that almost celebrates this kind of transcontinent or trans country element again between the Scotch and the Irish. Yeah, uh, which I think is really interesting. So, <clears throat> yeah, um, I think yeah, it, it's let's see. You know, as I said earlier, when we when we launched Combo, Stephen and I were we were prepared we were prepared for this onslaught of criticism and negativity and what the hell are you guys doing and seaweed and whiskey, but we were blown away by the positive reaction uh, that that we got. Uh, from from the industry in Ireland and abroad, so I, I don't second guess anything, Sergio. It's just one thing I've learned in my career. Uh, let's see what the consumers think of it when it comes yeah. out. We're certainly really excited. Yeah, we think it definitely merits the uh, uh, carrying the brand name Karak, mm -hmm. and um, you know, if nothing else, we think it's going to be a good source of discussion. Um, yeah, you know, in the in the industry. But look, we we have to wait a couple of weeks, I guess, to get our hands in it and and see what it tastes like. But look, I wish you the best of success with it. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a, been a long journey from 2013 to here. In terms, of, are you are you delighted you've done it? Uh, are you, you know, I'm sure it's been an awful lot of work. Are you, are you happy with having made that decision to jump and uh, and focus on your own brand and you know what's been the challenge and the sacrifices <laughs> and what do you what do you not like about it? Well, I think you know a lot of people may be listening and you know maybe including James from Sleeve Leave who does similar background to myself. Yeah. Um, um, I think once you leave the comfort of the mothership and go into the unknown. Um, again, just talking for myself, I, I, I think I've never had um, as much excitement. I've never had as much joy. I've never had as many as much anxiety yeah. or tears at the same time. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been a, an emotional kind of roller coaster uh, creating things. And the the one thing, as I as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, is that. I didn't know how to do a lot of things which were kind of basic to me once you have other people doing it for you in a large corporation. Yeah. Um, so there was a huge learning curve there. Um, I think the one thing I, I get an incredible uh, satisfaction from seeing not just the, the listings of our brands, but the odd comment somebody sends you from a corner in the world saying, yeah. wow, we really love your product. I remember when I launched Calac, first of all, um, everybody was saying to me, oh, you know, Patrick, once you actually see it on shelf in Celtic whiskey, you'll see this great sense of pride. Yeah. Yes, I was delighted. And thanks to Ali as our first, uh, uh, you know, stockist in, in the world. Um, I was actually thrilled to be on to see it on shelf, but the one thing that actually got me emotional was like mm -hmm. about a year later when I flew into Chicago, went to the best bar in the city, which was Green River uh, at the time, 
sat at the bar, opened a cocktail menu, and one of their signature cocktails was using our brand, Calac. And you didn't and know before, me, no? I knew it was going to happen, but I just didn't experience, I didn't know how, yeah, it, yeah, how, how yeah, I'd yeah. feel about it. And Might that to me was satisfaction. Sure. Because getting, you know, not get, getting across the initial hurdles, but actually getting through, breaking through the, the entry barriers into one of the top places. Yeah. Um, so that, that was definitely the kind of the, the kind of spotlight moment for me in terms of, uh, yes, I'm glad I did it. There, there was a lot of times, uh, Sergius, and I'll be completely honest here, during that three years when we launched Calac, that uh, I said, look, I'm done with this, yeah. you know, where we hit a brick wall. Uh, and, you know, the funny thing is the only thing that kept me going, and this sounds terrible to say, is once you actually put start putting some money into the game, you don't want it's to lose back. It. So had I not put any money in, I probably would have walked away, walked away a couple of times. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, but it's oh, it's been I know that been, feeling. It's re- <laughs> yeah, it's been really. Of course, you do. It's it's been a really exciting um, journey. I think uh, we've got in a huge amount of uh, you know help and support from the industry and our customers and um and as i said you know it's not about me i feel actually a little bit a little bit uncomfortable tonight because we've been talking a lot about me patrick shelley rather than the brands uh i i i actually like to put the spotlight on the brands um because i I think each one has their own personality their own character um and and a story to tell each of them yeah in, in their no, own and, and I, I think I, I mean, uh, people will see that that uh, it is about the brand, and, and as your own baby, it, it's about your brand that you build more than yourself. But I thought it'd be interesting for people to get to know you and and uh, and learn more about the brand and, and why you've done it. So, look, I just want to congratulate you on a very successful portfolio, and uh, you know there is a very premium nature to it without being overpriced and uh, very innovative as well in what you're doing and i i just love the way that you you think outside the box uh, and you, you you trust your instinct to go with something so congratulations i wish you every success uh, patrick going forward and thank you we good. should mention um uh, that you do work with stephen randall as well who's you know a really great brand ambassador for you and uh, is hitting the road day in day out and uh, <laughs> So, and, and a friend of mine I would consider as well. So, hello, Stephen. So, uh, we're looking forward to and all so catching just, up with. So, just can I just add that Kurok would never have happened without Stephen. So, yeah. without him nagging me all the time. Well, that's uh, that's a good so thing. Thanks, yeah, he nags me as well, but for other things. So, <laughs> I know Stephen's sound. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. how important is it that you have a, you know, and how difficult is it to build a team around you at the moment? um i think it's 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 all about i think the, the great thing that you know Stephen and i have is that we, we we kind of share the same vision uh the same approach to business um the same i suppose meticulous approach to everything we do in terms of you know releasing something or not down to the packaging and so on so i think that's really really important um <clears throat> So the culture, to answer your question, is very important that somebody is in line with, uh, because that's something we will not compromise on. Sure. You know, uh, whether it's the individual or not. We have a number of brand ambassadors uh, that have been incredibly helpful and achieved great things. Um, I find it's always uh, Stevens actually managing the brand ambassadors, but I think what we're doing quite well is actually anchoring each of their kind of key strengths Mm -hmm. uh, and saying, you know, what is this person, you know, potentially really good at and how can we unleash them to, to, to express their own creativity and innovation. Um, And that's been working really, really well uh, up to now. So um, we're, we're, we're still very small. So it's it's not like we have a, <clears throat> no, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't think, though, it, you know. Yeah, I mean, 
certainly on the outside it, you would think the brand is a, it's a, a bigger organization and a bigger brand than than i know it is but, which is a, a great testament to you to build up you know a strong brand with a strong following uh on, on quite limited resources I think, what, I think one of the things that <clears throat> again a lot of the you know industry people maybe who are listening tonight will realize is that um one of, I, I think one of the hurdles you know particularly in export and gaining traction I, either nationally or internationally uh, mm -hmm. actually <clears throat> it's not about having big budgets it's not about splashing money around it's 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 all about finding that right partner that gels with you that yeah. you uh that shares that same passion and where you can actually get much larger share of heart mm -hmm. uh, than you would in a larger organization um, yeah. so even though we're a small operation in terms of payroll um, the success of the brands has been our distributors but there's been a lot of work that's gone into actually choosing these distributors yeah um, yeah I'm sure yeah I mean distribution especially for the smaller ones is critical isn't it yeah yeah mm. Okay, well, look, I, I don't want to keep you forever because we'll start going into uh, other projects that yeah, I know you're working on and we probably shouldn't go there. But look, I just want to wish you the very best uh, continued success. Congratulations on being innovative and pushing the boundaries. And it's been very interesting and, uh, to get to know you. So best of luck, Sláinte. And uh, Thanks, I'm sir, looking Jeff, forward to the evening. Wakami 46%, 3,000 bottles coming out in a couple of weeks. So. Uh, where would yeah. it be available in Ireland? Just <clears throat> all of the, you know, we, we, we're stocked in all the major kind of in independent uh, retailers. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I better not start naming them in case I miss yeah, something. In case you leave one out, the usual, the usual suspects. Uh, <clears throat> the usual suspects, and then uh, you know, obviously, you know, Irish malts again, mm -hmm. um, and. You know, we, we also have our own online shop as well, originspirits.ie. Okay. Okay. So that's good for our guests to know. Yeah. So yeah. they can purchase this. And you ship internationally? We ship internationally, yes. Not very to every good. country in the world, but a uh, good portion. Yeah. Very good. But I, 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 I will just add, we, we actually prefer, you know, where possible that, uh, you know, customers buy from our local, their local just retailer. Yeah. Uh, you know, or distributor. Very good. Very good. Okay, Patrick, thank you very much for doing the honor of uh, announcing the new release on our show. I wish you the very best of luck with it. Dying to try it. And uh, we will speak to you soon in person, I hope. Great. A pleasure right. talking to you, Sergius, and great to be on Words of Whiskey. Cheers. Thanks very much, Patrick. All the best now. Ah, that's something slightly different. So I, I hope you you found that interesting and got to discover who is behind that the uh, Curric brand and the Calic brand and Ornabrac brands, and very much a, a you know somebody that had belief in their idea and followed it through and took the risk uh, of leaving the mothership, if you like, to go out and do something like that. So we wish them every success. And thank you very much for joining us uh, this Wednesday evening. We hope you're all well and safe. You enjoy the show. If you have any comments, please do put them in your uh, in the comments section below. And, and any questions you may have, we get them answered. And if you could follow the the channel as well, that would really help us also. So, good evening, Sancha. Look after yourselves, and thank you very much. <laughs>